That, by the way, look at that corn. Isn't that tremendous corn? That corn is taller than I am. I'm six nine. That's a good. That's a good seven, eight feet tall, and loaded with ears this fall. When he's sick, he's like the wolf and likes to be alone to heal. He says he listens to his lizard. He goes wild if you get him hooked on the barracudas in the New York book scene. But of all the animals, it is the grizzly bear he takes for his totem. He calls himself an American grizzly because he wrote Lord Grizzly and because he's been criticized and praised for telling stories that are too grisly. You see, we really are elementary tracks sort of crawling all over each other, eating each other, including th those grasses and those weeds and trees. Those are elementary tracks too, in a sense. See, they fight for air and they fight for sun and they fight for, uh, for room and they eat each other up. They live off each other. Uh, it's the same way with us. And in the midst of this maelstrom, this moiling, this boiling and uh, jumping and flying and banging, um, Adams, uh, there sits this uh, little, tiny, very fine, hardly to be seen, little flame that we call human intelligence. After 25 books and 70 years, most mornings he still walks to work on a new book. Father always said that you got the best work out of the horses and men from seven o'clock until 12, especially in the summertime, because in the afternoon it got hot. And some of these wonderful names, auto plier. Perfect name for a mechanic, pliers, plier, you know. Isn't that perfect? I gotta put that down. That's absolutely perfect name for a mechanic, Lord. Can't beat that. Looked at in one way, Manfred's writing a 200-year mural of life in a particular place, Siouxland. He made up that name to have a handle for the region from the Badlands to the North Woods. The mural starts with the Indians in Conquering Horse and Scarlet Plume. It goes on with the Wild West in King of Spades and Riders of Judgment. The plowing of the plains are in This is the Year and the Choke Cherry Tree, and life in the cities in Morning Red and Milk of Wolves. Looked at in this way, his novels, rooms, tales, and poems are all chapters in one big book. On the other hand, one critic argues his books are impossible to cubbyhole because reading them all is like looking at a mountain range with 25 peaks. Either way, what he really wants is to tell a story. I try to write in such a way that you can't find a feather out of place. The whole uh, bird flies, lifts up out of the grass, rises as an arch, and then sails in the grass, disappears. That's the way a good story should be, too. The saga of Siouxland is grounded in the earth, the golden bowl, green earth, or Eden Prairie, as he titled three of his books. Wild land, like a wild spirit, can be cultivated with language, as in this dreamy poem from Winter Count, which he blames for the rumor that uh, he runs around bare naked. A weird rock lies bare and exposed in the virgin prairie north of my teepee. Sometimes I walk over and take off all my clothes and lie down on it and dream. I sometimes have the feeling that I'm lying on a great bone from some super mastodon freshly picked by eagles. But mostly, I feel that I'm lying on some fundamental rib of the earth. The rock reveals what the earth looked like when it was all still boiling at birth. Sioux quartzite, they call it. Scarlet threads of fury. I take much comfort lying on my rock in the sun. My pink belly blends well with its twisting reds and purples. 
My tan shoulders go well with its oranges and blues and browns. I feel an old heat rising out of the rock. It fires my young arteries and my young heart. After a time, I bound to my feet and run all the way home. There's a lover's lane where we used to have fun chasing up couples laying in the grass there. <laughs> we weren't supposed to be doing that, but we did it. And then as you come here, you, you slowly but surely, you spread out and move into Siouxland, all over the country. Follow the rivers into Siouxland. Living near Laverne, Minnesota, in no time he can whip to his writer-in-residence job at the University of South Dakota at Vermilion, nip up to the Twin Cities and hop a plane, or zip down to Dune, Iowa, the town nearest his birthplace. Like Thomas Hardy's Wessex, Sinclair Lewis' Gopher Prairie, or William Faulkner's Yakna Patofa, Siouxland is full of people based on real characters. He's written stories from the point of view of Indian braves, sports writers, country oafs, mothers, murderers, ball players, school marms, preachers, and politicians. Stories so true, they seem unbelievable. Well, I figured that by the time I get through writing about all the Siouxland, I'll have caught up everything that happens anywhere else on the earth. The whole, um, the whole human, as Balzac put it, the whole human comedy will have been uh, described and delineated, and, and, and as we'd say out here, taken care of. I, I, I like the words taken care of a lot better than delineated. He was born Frederick Feichema in Rock Township in a barnstorming blizzard, 1912. The Feichemas were a farm family of Frisians from Friesland, a country now part of the Netherlands. Later, he changed his name to the more American Manfred, which like Feichema means free man or man of peace, because school kids thought of other names for Feichema. The farm is now run by Mr. Brenneman. They remember old Fries. Uh, this is a shibboleth. You know, like in the Bible, they had this one where um, when somebody came from the wrong tribe and went across the border, they have him say this uh, shibboleth in the Bible, and then if he didn't say it right, off went his head. And the Frisians had one too. When the Hollanders came north into Friesland to make sure he wasn't a, a fifth columnist or, you know, someone that was spying on him, they had him say this thing in Fries. Buter, bre, and grena chiz. Butter bread, butter bread and, and green cheese. Che green cheese. cheese. Uh, who that net says it can, who that cannot say, yeah. is gen op roch da freeze. And you see, if you, he could never say op roch. Okay, he said it like I did, so it yeah. wouldn't be true. But a real Frisian would get that real guttural in oh, there. Yeah. And if he yeah. didn't say it the right way, off went his head. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, that's when they were fighting. Mm -hmm. um, Butter, bre, grena cheese. Grena cheese, cheese. cheese, not, uh, yeah, not yeah. Yeah. Cheese. cheese and freeze have yeah, to yeah, have to yeah, rhyme. Yeah. Yeah. Now there's uh, there's a lot of those. Oh yes. Yeah. See that sounds like Chaucer. You know, van der April with her shoulder suta, the druchta marcha has pierced to the root. Yep. I told this to my uncle. I recited this to uh, my uncle Rumka. Oma Rumka, Umka Rumka. You know, he had an odd name. Uh, that's Uncle, <laughs> Uncle, Uncle Runka. And uh, he listened and he says, well, he says, tis gen echt a fries. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> nay. <laughs> nay, tis gen echt a fries. It isn't quite true Frisian, you know. <laughs> and this was Chaucer to him. Uh, nay, that, that was no, of course, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. He traces his love for telling stories to his stoop-talking uncles and his school teacher poet, Aunt Catherine. While his pa swore you are standing in bookshit, his ma dreamed he'd be a preacher. Fred romances the hard and steady discipline of the farm. Not knowing any better, you thought that was the, the great world. And in many ways it was. It was, certain, it was a certain endless regularity, you know, that was drilled into you. Well, when you write a novel, you always add, you know, two or three pages a day. And you do it just like a farmer cultivate 10 rows a day till you got the whole field cultivated. And then one cultivation isn't going to clean out all the bad words or the bad weeds, so you cultivate it once more. 
And if I have to go over a manuscript four times, well, that's the same thing in the old days as my father and I having to cultivate the corn four times. Same thing, okay? same, same actual process. And uh, where a farmer will farm soils, a uh, writer farms brain cells. And that barn was there when we were here, when I was a boy. And that's this where, piece uh, from I the semi-autobiographical Green Earth is about the time he saved one of his five brothers from the mad sows. In the story, Fred is like Free Alfredson. Free has been dreaming in a hammock when he wakes to the sound of shrieks. Yow! Albert was down and the fat sows were eating him. The sows were fighting over the first good bite of him. Albert on his back was crying so hard his tongue was flittering in and out of his mouth. His eyes were crossed almost out of sight under his nose. Wild! Free quick looked around. He spotted a wagon rod stuck in the ground near the fence. With both hands he jerked the rod out, then surged up over the plank fence, landed right in the middle of the biting sows, began flailing away at their humped over dipping necks. At the same time he began kicking at their snouts with his bare feet. Albert, he yelled, get up, get up! The old fat sows left off biting Albert and charged Free. Their snouts came yucking straight for him. Free got mad, what? Pigs dared to tackle him? He was Free Alfredson. A wild shout came out of him. He wailed at their flat snouts with his iron rod so hard and so fast he looked like an egg beater. Get up, Albert! Get out of here, you dumb bastard, while I fight him off! But Albert just kept laying there in the hog turds and the dirty corn cobs. He cro his crossed eyes were snuck, stuck under his nose. There was nothing for it but to drop the rod, grab Albert, and throw him over the plank fence. Yuck, yuck, yuck! The round snouts of the bad sows came after Free like a bunch of sink drains. One hog got in a good bite just above Free's knee. She ripped open his overalls. You sons of bitches biting me. In one great leap, Free jumped clear over to where Albert lay, grabbed him by the pants and belly, threw him way over the fence. Then before the sows could wheel, could wheel around and grab him, Free sprang up over the top of them, coming up off the ground like a grasshopper, lifting himself, sailing over the fence, and landed on his belly beside Albert. Oh, both were safe. The fat sows ruckled up against the plank fence, mad at them. Ma's voice was suddenly crying above Free. Boy, oh my boy. Free rolled over. There stood Ma in her long green dress. Both her hands were holding up her gold hair. Free, free, what a brave boy you are. When his mother died and his father remarried, Fred felt free to leave home. With his mail-ordered works of Shakespeare and the Bible in his knapsack, he traveled. He went east and west. He went to Calvin College in Michigan and got a BA in English, a teacher's life certificate, and a basketball knee, which later was replaced with a plastic joint. He caught TB, spent two years in a sanatorium, and wrote about it in Boy Almighty. He tried drawing, painting, music. He married. His three children are writers. And all along, he was writing. Stories, secretly. Sports for the papers articles for medical journals. A self-described liberal lefty, Manfred was Hubert Humphrey's campaign manager when Humphrey ran for mayor of Minneapolis. But he declined Hubert's invite to more politics to turn full bore on the books. He says he was learning to follow his lizard, the most primitive of the three parts of the brain. Well, but I think the lizard, um knows when something's true or false, like a dog knows when somebody comes in the yard, whether it's enemy or friend. The mammal mind wants to love everybody and uh, embrace everything, and uh, so it'll often pick up uh, stingers and, and bad things, or, and uh, it doesn't until it, got, it gets hurt, then it will back off, but it never learns, really. The neocortex, you know, would like not to be in our bodies. It would prefer just to play chess all the time have nothing but mental games going. But the lizard brain doesn't make any mistakes. It always knows. This will keep me alive, this will kill me. 
I was in high school going to Western Academy, and that was the year that I ran to school every morning, seven and a half miles up and seven and a half miles back. And I came home in the afternoon around five o'clock. And as I stepped in the kitchen, there was my dad sitting there by the stove. And my mother saw me looking at him. My mother says, my mother had a very kind voice and was always ten and had very little sarcasm in her. She, did, she, she very rarely spoke in irony. But this time she says, yeah, that's it, your father. He's taking the jumping off of windmills now. And I didn't say anything, of course, and Dad didn't say anything to that either, and then he lifted his hand off his nose, and then that sort of a... So, well, she says, you better do the chores tonight. I can't leave here. Um, I got a team of horses is tied to the fence there by the windmill. And, uh, I didn't finish. There's two rows yet to pick. You better go and get those horses, too. They can't stand there forever. So I quick changed my yard clothes, and I went down there, and... Uh, a little later on, when he got around where he could talk, he told me what had happened. He said he uh, had the two rows left to pick, and he saw that the mill was facing the wrong way and it had, had wound up and got tight instead of, and so he went, climbed up there to turn the mill around and face the uh, rooster into the wind. And just as he was going up into the opening into the platform up there, uh, the cleat broke in his hands. And he had his hand on the next one already, and it, no, he just, he pulled out the next hand, that one broke, but he had this in his hand, so he leaned on this one and made a grab, but that broke. Then he grabbed for the one down near his belly button, and that broke, and he was falling back already. Then he knew he was done for. But he thought, well, if I'm going to fall, I, if I fall straight this way, I'll land right on the bottom cross pieces of this mill, because, you know, it's sloped sideways. The best thing is just to kick out as far as I can. At least I'll miss those cross pieces, and I'll hit the earth, and I won't be cut up by the cross pieces. Then when he's out in the air, it occurred to him, well, I gotta land some way that I come out alive. And he remembered uh, grasshoppers. So when they land, they always land with these big legs slightly bent and they land and they kind of, there's a kind of a nice easy riding motion there, see, when they land. So he uh, set his legs like a grasshopper. And when he hit the, they, of course they flattened up against his button, threw him forward. And his nose skidded into the grass. Oh, that's fast thinking, boy. There is a case where I think where the uh, lizard wasn't afraid and it decided to tackle the problem rather than retreat from it, you know, and then it used the neocortex to figure it out quickly. Once, prowling around this piece of wild land called the Blue Mounds, he found a 1,250-foot-long wall of rocks. At the equinox, it lies exactly east and west with the sun. One theory suggests it was built by an early Mississippian culture over 700 years ago. Manfred feels the wall's spiritual power, what the Indians call Wakan. At the Land of Memories, a powwow in Mankato, he talks about Wakan. The Indian notion of Wakan is uh, not a notion of a god sitting in one spot like our god supposedly does, a white man's god, uh, but he's everywhere. Inside of all things, stone, trees, and grass, and all that, there sits a, a dancing, a, a moving, a um, twinkling, rippling kind of uh, power. Um, and this is exactly a description of the inside of the atom when you examine it. If you know the Indian religion very well and you've been around it, that is the old time Indian religion, and then you read quantum mechanics, it's as if you're suddenly given uh, the words uh, for what uh, walk on means. About the only thing that haunts him in the whole wild world besides some of his own memories, is a new fear we all share. And somewhere along the line, some nut who doesn't think about children, or mothers, or sweethearts, or literature, or works of art, is gonna push a button. And we'll take another 
two billion years, or certainly a billion years for a life to come back that resembles ours. In this, not, 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 not two-legged necessarily, but to have brains and, and uh, have some notion of, uh, of what, we would, what we call culture. I worry about that a lot. Sitting at what he calls his command post in the house he built himself, it doesn't bother him too much that some have called his books too earthy, too male, too weird, a mix of science, religion, and politics. When his book, The Man Who Looked Like the Prince of Wales, appeared, the Dune Town sign which read Home of Frederick Manfred was smeared with mud. It doesn't bug him because he's had his fair share of praise. In fact, the wildest thing you could say about Manfred is he's almost won every big literary prize, even being nominated for the Nobel four times. Even a critic with reservations like Wallace Stegner writes, he is not a writer in the usual sense. He is a natural force related to hurricanes, deluges, volcanic eruptions, and the ponderous formation of the continents. Tom McGrath puts it this way in a poem for Fred Manfred called Gulliver's Travels. It wasn't just that he was tall, but that he made us feel we had lived all our life on our knees. His most popular book is Lord Grizzly, one of the Buckskin Man tales. It is about the odyssey of Hugh Glass, the frontiersman who was mauled by a grizzly bear and then crawled across 200 miles of wilderness. To get a feel for the story, Manfred spent several days crawling in the sand hills. Manfred, take four. Later, author turned actor when Manfred recreated the ordeal of Hugh Glass in this screen test for a movie of Lord Grizzly. This passage occurs near the end of Hugh's epic crawl. It is read by Robert Bly. A great round moon followed him, both him and his ghost yellow dog. It watched his wormings across dry grass country, first from its rising in the east and then from its setting in the west. What amazed him was the way his body had taken to going on all fours, like any four-legged creature of the wild. Even with a leg in the slape, he got around very handily, could even run a little if he wanted to. And the run when he tried it wasn't just an awkward one either, but a run that coursed, a run that lifted him off the ground a little, that gave his carcass a coasting motion all of its own, like some rowboat with four oars flailing water. It gave Hugh a peculiar insight into how the four-legged animals felt as four-legged beings, an insight so sharp that his first impulse was to sniff at the thought of it instead of smile at it. It also gave him a peculiar insight into the curse God had put on Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. God had changed Nebuchadnezzar's heart from that of a man to that of a beast and had him driven from among men and made it his portion to eat of the grass of the earth like an ox. And God caused Nebuchadnezzar's body, to be made wet with the dew of heaven till his hairs grew out like eagle feathers and his nails grew out like bird claws. I wonder how long that's going to last. <laughs> no, it's, it's marble, but you know, you wonder how long that's going to last. I think the reason that I write is not for, used to be to put something down and be there for keeps. But I think mostly it's that uh, I get a second life out of life. I get my own life that I live every day, eating pancakes and, and loving my children and, uh, and uh, some ladies. And, um, and then in the books, I, ha I, live, a, I live yet another life the lives of these people and I'm, so I get a, a double take out of life. I get two lives out of it. 
the first one vanishes, the second one gets into a book for a little while and stays there. What about you, boy? Is your work coming along? Are you still making candles against darkness and wrong? The whole thing is to blast, blast and blast again, to fill the black with songs, poems, temples, paintings, anything at all. Attack, attack, open up and let go, even if it's only blowing, but blast. And I say this, loving my God, because we are all he has at last. So what about it, boy? Is your work going well? Are you still lighting lamps against darkness and hell? Down in Sulan, life sphered on. Days drifted into evening reds, nights dreamed into morning grays. The sun shone, rains fell, wombs became fruitful and multiplied. Lightning struck, old bowls fell to the ground, twigs rotted and returned to dust. Deep answered unto deep, and clouds of winged seeds rode abroad on the coasting wings.